Lakeland Public Television's Common Ground is brought to you by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Production funding for Common Ground is made possible by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Hi, and welcome to this week's edition of Common Ground. I'm your host, Ashley Hall. Common Ground is a weekly series that highlights northern and central Minnesota culture. Each week, we'll explore the unique people, places, and events that are an important part of our region. Each week, Common Ground videographers, editors, and myself will take viewers on a journey of exploration into the worlds of art, history, and culture. This week on Common Ground, meet Wesley Ellis of Shevlin, who grew up during the Great Depression and tells stories of hopping the train west. Paul Jensen of Swanville uses sandblasting to create beautiful images in glass and mirrors. Plus, the New York Mills Regional Cultural Center is bringing artists to light and providing cultural opportunities. I'm Paul Jensen, and my business is uh, Imagery and Glass, and uh, I uh, focus on etched and carved glass. Now, etching can be uh, uh, any way to abrade the glass. So it can be a Dremel tool, it can be a diamond tool, a uh, laser. In my case, it's all sandblasting. Everything I do is sandblasting. So I'm using it, uh, the sandblaster as a carving tool. I'm using it as a, a shading tool. Um, it, it, it does a lot of different things and it, it leaves me free to uh, use a lot of techniques and, and, and things. So um, uh, I'm able to achieve a lot of results with one tool basically is what it amounts to. So what I do is I start out, we start out with a design. Now the design can be a uh, uh, customer uh, design, as in this case, I'm, I'm using uh, a subcontracting for a, a custom door company. Um, they'll send me a design and then I will take off on that design. Uh, do the working drawings, so everything is all drawn out in pencil. So before we start with anything, we clean the glass and we apply a, a, a rubber matting to the glass uh, on the side that's to, to be carved here. So this is uh, uh, kind of a light rubber matting. It's easy to cut and uh, it's applied right to the glass. The glass is clean very well uh, and, and we stick that down. Once that's done, we apply the drawing to, to the, uh, to the uh, rubber matting, which is also called uh, stencil or uh, resist. Uh, the drawing will be laid down with the pencil side down, right on top of the resist. And I've already got one down here, uh, and it's uh, sitting right on top there. It's taped down in the, in the right position. And so what I do is then I just take anything, and I'm, in this case I'm using a little, a little uh, uh, container to, to rub off the pencil marks on, on, the, uh, on the stencil or the resist. And I've already done a little bit of it beforehand, so we can take a look here. And the pencil mark will rub right off onto the, uh, the resist. Okay, in this case here, I'm doing a, I don't know if you can see that or not, but there's going to be a deer scene on this one. you got two deer here, there's going to be kind of a lake, and uh, everything is rubbed off, and it looks like it's, looks like it's going to work. So we just take that off. Now comes kind of the tedious part. You have to ink all these lines in now. So we grab the trusty Bic pen here and we just, uh, just ink in all the lines because once we start sandblasting uh, on, on this, the pencil lines will blow away essentially and uh, there will be nothing left for me to, uh, to see where I'm going or, or what I'm doing. Now this is going to be a combination of carving and uh, shading and a uh, little bit of all the techniques that I use here. So the deer will be deep carved, the, uh, the background here will be shaded in, and, and, uh, and, and the lake will be slightly shaded, so you all, these little areas right here will be, uh, will be really finely uh, blasted in so to make it look like, like waves, essentially. It's just a, you know, just, these are just working drawings, essentially, the art part hasn't even started yet, you know, I mean, so, so uh, that's what's kind of fun about, about doing this. There's so many different levels to the art. So you have to do the drawings, which is one part of the art. Uh, you have to, you know, do all the cutting, knowing how, which uh, to pull off first. So, so that, and, and that'll come right now. We'll, uh, 
We'll use the X-Acto knife to cut on the inked parts then. Now with, when you're carving, you have to remember that anything that sticks out at you in the picture, the, 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 the closest thing to you will be blasted first. So in this case, like let's say we're blasting the, uh, we're doing the uh, antler first because the antler is in front of these trees, so that's gotta be blasted first, okay? So we'll, and this part of the antler right here is in front of this part of the antler. So you gotta kinda work backwards, essentially, is what you're doing. So what you're doing is you're carving into the, the, the uh, medium. Uh, with uh, wood, you're carving around it so your, your image sticks up. This is actually into it, so it's viewed from the opposite side. So, so everything carved will be uh, 3D. And now if I wanted to do this, I would cut this out here. I don't know if you can see that or not, but this part of the antler. And, and everything will get cut out. Before I even go into the blasting booth to uh, blast this, this will all be cut out. So when I'm in there, I'm just gonna start pulling pieces, okay? So now this, this little piece is in front of these two pieces of the antler here. Okay, so this is the very first thing that I'm gonna blast on this project, right here. So what I'll do is I'll pull that off, like that. Okay, that'll be blasted first. It's tough to get a handle on it at first because you're working backwards, but uh, once you do, it's hard to get a handle on working forwards again after you do it for a while, so. Now, uh, once I'm in the booth, and because the, uh, the booth isn't very uh, camera friendly, we'll, we'll just uh, do a little demonstration right here. Um, when you're in the booth, there, there's three things that you need for, uh, for uh, doing abrasive blasting. You need an air compressor, you need uh, a pot such as this, so, something to hold the abrasive in, and you need the abrasive. All the abrasive will be recycled in the booth, so once it's done blasting, all the abrasives blast out, it's swept up, put back in, and it just keeps on recycling until uh, it, it's all gone. When you're in the booth, because I have a walk-in booth, I need a, a hood with an air supply, and I'll need a, a, a dust, dust collector, something to ventilate, you know, so, so you need to be safe about that. Um, once I'm in there, once this is in there, I will start blasting. So I'll, I'll, I have this pulled already, I'll blast this first, I'll pull this next, pull this next, you know, and, and on down the line. Just keep working myself, uh, you know, all the way through the whole, whole picture. Something like this might take about a week to totally finish up. When I'm in the booth, this, uh, this pot will be hooked up to the uh, air compressor. The hose goes right on here. This is my regulator. Uh, this will let the air come into the tank. The tank will, uh, will fill up with air. And then I just use this uh, ball valve here to, uh, uh, you know, to turn it on and off. I'll adjust the flow out of the bottom. There's a little ball valve down here. The aperture, uh, the hole in, in here is about a sixteenth of an inch, okay, and, and uh, that's about perfect for the kind of carving that I'm doing. Okay, once I'm in there, this is set up on the easel, I'm going to start blasting. I have my hood on, and uh, what I do is just turn it on, the abrasive comes out of here, goes into here, and I carve it as deep as I need it to be. Now that's kind of the art of it knowing when to stop, because you can blast all the way, I've done it before, blast all the way through the glass when, when you're starting out, if you're car carving something deep, you don't want that, okay? You want it to look real deep, but it, in, in reality, it's really not that deep, so. So I'll start blasting here, pull that off, blast, pull that off, blast, on down the line, and, uh, and, and I'll keep uh, taking it out of the booth every once in a while, taking a look at it, uh, seeing how everything's coming along and, and just uh, and uh, making sure that uh, everything looks the way I want it to. So, okay, what I'd kind of like to do is just uh, do a start to finish real uh, real small project. We're going to start with the glass fab first. Uh, in this case, I'm cutting a diameter out of uh, a 12 inch diameter out of some quarter inch uh, glass here. And we'll just go ahead and start breaking it. Now, we have to get this uh, little circle out of here. We have our 12-inch circle, so now we're going to want to uh, sand the edges real quick. So we wash it off good now, make sure the compound's all off. So we can apply some uh, 
some stencil or uh, another name for it, resist to it. So here we go. We got our stencil on here. We have our uh, uh, glass. It's ready to go. Um, the pattern can be transferred on. In this case, uh, uh, I had the pattern on, on this one already done. In this case, I'm just going to draw something freehand on here. And we'll just go with something, uh, maybe, maybe just a little, uh, little free-flowing, something uh, like this. Now these are overlapping each other, so I'm going to do a quick carving on them here in just a little bit. Now we'll cut it out. Now we've got to decide which ones we want out first, uh, which ones we want to blast first. This is. Uh, this is where it gets a little complicated. This is going over top of this, okay? And this is going underneath this, so they're kind of overweaving each other. Now, if I was to pull this off all the way, it would get into this one. So, so you kind of want to just be able to blast right, you know, right where you need to, get that a little bit deeper right here. And then once you blast that, it, it'll be underneath it, so. Now, the one thing about uh, this type of uh, work is it's pretty unforgiving. If you mess up, when you're blasting, after you've worked on something about a week, you can mess up the whole thing and have to start all over again. So you got to really be on your toes when you're, you're working with it. So right now it's ready to take it to the booth. And uh, I guess I'll do that and see you in a bit. <laughs> um, so here it is. We've uh, blasted it. If you look from this side, you can kind of see if you look close enough, how these overlap each other here. So once we have that all blasted, it's all done. We're just going to remove the uh, move the uh, the resist, um, and there we go. There's a finished product. My name is Jamie Robertson. I'm the director of the New York Mills Regional Cultural Center. It's been operating for about 20 years. It was founded by John Davis, who is now the director at Lanesboro Art Center. Um, he started this place as a retreat for artists who were gonna come here and do their work and also share some of their inspiration and imagination with the community and that has been a characteristic of the center since its inception so we continue with a long-standing program of arts retreat folks uh, people who come and visit for two to six weeks and stay in a small arts retreat house that we have available in the gallery here we have two galleries one upstairs and one downstairs we use the downstairs gallery all year long and the upstairs gallery occasionally and uh, the downstairs gallery is home to about eight to ten shows every year. And uh, we try to have something in the show that connects with large themes in art nationally and worldwide, but doing it through works that are created by local folks and uh, or people who have a connection here. Every year we also have a juried art exhibit in the fall that uh, folks can enter. Our regional art show that is annual also is the non-juried show. But it's, uh, it's open to any artist in Minnesota and anybody who wants to can submit two works and we'll hang those works and usually the gallery is full. This, right now, this week, Minnesota State High School League 6A show and that is a special show of 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, and 11th and 12th graders from uh, 13 schools in our region. We also have, for many years, for, forever really, uh, had, since our inception, had shows of the artwork of K through 12 students in our area. So we also, we continue to have those as well. We do a lot of other things as well. Besides the visual arts, we have uh, Performing arts activities here all the time too. We have about 30 concerts annually that we, where we have Minnesota artists as well as artists from farther away. But the focus really of the center has been on Minnesota artists. One of our, probably the signature event for the New York Mills Cultural Center is the Great American Think Off. It happens on the second Saturday of every June 
and it's a amateur philosophy contest that was also the uh, invention of John Davis, the founder of the Cultural Center, and it continues today. We get 300 to 500 essays every year on different topics, and we ask for people to take one side or the other and make an argument, write a 750 word essay and submit it to us. The uh, essays have been submitted. The committee that reads the essays has selected the four finalists, and uh, those four finalists will be notified and invited to come here for the live debate here in New York Mills. We usually fill up the James Mann Center for the Arts over at the New York Mills School 500 seat auditorium with folks who are willing to come in on a beautiful June night and listen to four people make a debate on that kind of question. And it's quite a wonderful experience. Th that kind of is kind of a participatory event. And what we've done is try to make that kind of participation in the arts characteristic of some of the other things that we do too. For instance, in, uh, on December 21st every year, we have the Longest Night Music Festival where community musicians, singers, songwriters, players come in and uh, give a concert and it's just a free concert for everybody in the community. And it, we uh, have a winter festival in February every year where we do snowshoeing and cross-country skiing and uh, environmental education. We have kite making and kite flying events where folks from New York Mills High School from Perm uh, make kites and fly them. We have about 500 kids making kites and flying them. It's a really nice time. Then in August, we have a large-scale puppet pageant that is a dramatization of stories from the Finnish national epic poem, the Kalevala, and uh, just events like that that we have throughout the year that are meant to encourage participation from the larger community in the arts. Whatever happens with the arts, it seems like it's very possible for the arts to be considered to be elitist, and that the sense that not it's always a smaller percentage of the total population that participate actively in making art. And uh, what we're trying to do is to grow that number so that more and more community people who might not have had a hand in that before are willing to take a try at it. Me, I'm Wes Ellis. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 see the Big Depression hit before the before the Dust Bowls. <laughs> when I was about uh, in the uh, eighth grade, that's when uh, hard times hit, and you couldn't you couldn't sell anything and get anything for it because the bottom dropped right out to where oats was six cents, barley was eight, wheat was thirty-five, and so on. And you couldn't sell cattle because you'd owe shipping charges. The only thing we dared to ship was hogs, if we knew they were top. You could get a little bit out of a truckload of hogs at two and a half cents. <laughs> that was tops for hogs. But you better not ship hogs unless you knew they were tops, otherwise you'd owe transportation. So then it went from that into the into a drought, and that started out, well, I was plowing in the fall, and we'd had a bumper crop, the biggest crop I can remember of, and while I was plowing, the dirt started to drift till I couldn't see the ground from where I was sitting on the plow, plowing with horses, of course, and uh, so I couldn't tell if I was staying in the furrow or not. So I put the horses up in the barn. And I went in the house and my mother was home alone and I looked out the window and I said, come look out the window. You'll probably never see this again. Just then we couldn't see the windmill. There was a cloud of dust. So heavy you couldn't see the windmill. Well, it went from that to much, much worse. The dust storms got so heavy that there were times when it was darker than any night you could imagine. Now how would we manage to live through all of that dust? I have no idea because we, we breathed it steadily even if the wind wasn't blowing. 
where there was still dust in the earth. There was days when, uh, when the wind wasn't blowing that you couldn't see the sun because of the amount of dust in the air. It was just a kind of a glow. You just lived in a sort of a glow. And uh, horses and cattle started starving to death. And um, the only money I was making was getting a horse once in a while. Because, uh, well, the only reason I got to skin a horse was because a farmer there would probably have a horse that he'd had so long he, he thought so much of it that he couldn't shoot it and, and take the hide off. So he'd come to me. If you want the hide, you can and do away with that old horse for me. But otherwise, the farmers skinned their own horses because that was their only source of money too. Well, then they, they, uh, that was the time of uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt as president. And uh, he started buying up, you know, the cattle were condemned and they would buy them up for a little or nothing, you know, give the farmers something to eat something to eat on and then they dug deep, deep trenches and drove the cattle in there and shot them and covered them up. So I, uh, I went and applied for a job shooting cattle and uh, they said no we don't have a job for you. I said if it's uh, marksmanship you want I am a good shot and if, if you wish I'll I'll demonstrate. No, they said it isn't that. We have to save what jobs there are for the school teachers. And I said, that don't sound very fair to me because they got eight months work the way it is and I have none. Well, they said they figured that, government figures that uh, teaching is very important. So we gotta, we gotta do something to keep the teachers occupied. That's when I decided I got to leave the country because there's no, you can't live without a little bit of money. <laughs> so I went to, a, I talked to a neighbor boy and I said, I'm getting out of here. And I said, I hear it's better if we go west. He said, I'd sure like to go along. I said, I sure need you, need you along. He said, I don't think my folks will let me go though. Anyway, I seen him three days later and he said, I can go with you. He said, my folks says, as long as it's you that's going, I'm going with my, uh, I can go with you. Well, that made me feel pretty good. I didn't know I had that good a reputation. So, <laughs> so anyway, we headed west. Well, I'd rode freight train otherwise too, because I'd, I'd rode it four times over the big hump in a side door Pullman. That's a boxcar. And the big hump is the Rocky Mountains. <laughs> That's the only way you get any place of stealing the ride on the freight train. <laughs> so anyway, that was the beginning of our trip west. Going west, Aberdeen, South Dakota was the first, first uh, big terminal. So then from then on, why it was dry and hot. Across, I call it desert. You get west of the Missouri River why it's cactus and uh, sagebrush clear the Rocky Mountains. <laughs> it's exhausting riding a freight train because very seldom do you get a, a boxcar that'll ride smooth. It's always bouncing. On a shaky boxcar was a, some flat wheel. <laughs> and sometimes they were so flat that it would have shook you apart. So we'd have to put our hands on the floor like this and our feet on the floor and take the jolt there. Otherwise, I think it would have killed the guy. <laughs> so uh, you, you got so exhausted, you, you slept. <laughs> but when there's two, why that's... Uh, one guy generally stays awake while one sleeps because there's good guys on the freight and there's bad guys too. There's a couple of my friends didn't make it. Somebody hit them on the head for just in case they had a little money on them. And it was a slow climb with the train up into the mountains. One place I called Louis' attention to it, I said, come here, take a look. I said, 
You can see where we were this morning. This was in the evening. We went up a cliff. I could see six railroads beneath us, like stair steps. And I know I could have threw a stone back to where we'd been that morning. Well, then it got dark, so I don't know, the next morning we was clear up at the top of the Rockies. And it was cold up there. I mean, it was really cold. Snow all over, and I, I bet it was zero, maybe even colder than that. We had to huddle together to keep from freezing. And we were lucky we had a comedian in the bunch. He started singing when it was springtime in the Rockies. And that made us a lot a laugh, you know, with some of his other comics. And I think that helped keep our circulation going. <laughs> Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. We hope that you enjoyed the show and we look forward to seeing you next week right here on Common Ground. If you have a segment idea for Common Ground, please contact us at legacy at lptv.org or call us at 218-333-3022. segments or copies of Common Ground, please call 218-333-3020. Production funding for Common Ground is made possible by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. If you enjoyed this segment of Lakeland Public Television's Common Ground, consider making a contribution at lptv.org.